Hi, uh, this video's objective is to show you how to use AutoQuant or to remind you how to use AutoQuant. Um, so to be able to use AutoQuant under the current circumstances, you will need to do a remote login to our workstation. So I'm not going to go into how to do that. You will need to install and connect to VPN, and then you will need to connect remotely to our workstation, having previously made a reservation and uh, logged into the kiosk. All of that is explained uh, on documentation that's on our website. What I'm going to focus on right now in this video is how to actually um, use AutoQuant to do stuff. And so the idea for AutoQuant, this is um, the software here that I'm pointing to right now. It's what's called the deconvolution software. And so very briefly, uh, what deconvolution software does is it makes a model of how your sample and your microscope interact to form an image. And so whenever that interaction occurs, uh, there's typically blurring of features in your sample. So things that are very small don't show up how they actually look. Um, they showed up sort of blurred because of how light interacts with those small objects. And in addition, there's noise um, because you typically do not get enough photons to, to get an, an image of those objects that's perfect. There's a little bit of noise because you, you typically don't get enough photons, so there's a little bit of speckling in the image. And so the idea with uh, deconvolution software is it makes a model of how your sample and your microscope interacts, in, taking into account things like um, how things are blurred, um, what kind of noise there might be, based on all sorts of information about your microscope and the sample. And then it allows you to calculate a new image that is a better representation of your objects of your object, excuse me, than the original image. Um, so the example I'm going to work through um, are these five images here, um, which were acquired on our LSM 700 size confocal microscope. And what I'm going to show you is first how to um, look at and deconvolve one of the images and then how to do a batch process where we deconvolve many at the same time. So the first thing I'm going to do is open AutoQuant by double clicking on it. Okay, so this is the AutoQuant window. To open things, you can use this icon, you can do file open, or you can just drag stuff in. So because I want to start by just deconvolving one image, I am just going to drag one image into AutoQuant and work through that example. So I drag it in. Okay, so when you drag in a single image into AutoQuant, AutoQuant automatically detects a number of uh, things from that image, and those things are noted here, and it automatically gives you a visual representation of that image, which is this here. Um, so let's first discuss what this visual representation is. So what you're seeing here is a maximum Z projection in the X, Y plane. So this is if, if you have a stack of images, which you will need uh, to do deconvolution. Deconvolution is a three-dimensional procedure. What the software will automatically generate if you drag a single image into it is a maximum Z projection, meaning for every pixel, it looked through the entire stack and found the, the pixel that was the brightest in each of the channels, and that's what it's showing you. So it's sort of a smushed version of everything. In addition, if you press this or this, these are side views, which are smushed. So these are maximum projections in the X, um, Z dimension across Y, or in the Y, Z dimension across X. So it's as if everything is sort of smushed together and you're looking at it from the side. So these representations can be useful just to get a sense of how blurry things are or how noisy things are. Um, what you do with this doesn't really affect the deconvolution. It's just a neat way of looking at the data um, if you need to. Um, the other thing you can do, which does not affect um, the deconvolution, but can be useful to start getting a sense of what might be going on here, is to do some image enhancement. Again, this is just visual enhancement. It doesn't really affect um, the data at all. And so what you can do is if you click here where it says all channels, you can select channels one at a time. And by dragging this slider to the left, you can make certain channels brighter. And so, for example, this is a gray channel, which evidently I think this was a control, so there's nothing in the gray channel. 
um, but let's do it on on a, on a channel that's a little has a little bit more structure. So this red channel, if we increase um, the contrast by moving this to the left, you can sort of see features that you couldn't before. They're all there. We haven't affected the data. This is just a way of um, enhancing it so we can see it a little better. That's all that is. And you can do that for the different channels. OK. All right. But this is all display. The real meat of this software is here. So I told you that the software makes a model of the interaction of your microscope with your sample. And so the software has to have information about your sample and your microscope. And some of that information, it guesses correctly. Some of it, it guesses incorrectly. And there are cases where it doesn't know what to guess. So I'm going to work you through an example on um, of what is typical when you open a either .czi or .lsm file from a Zeiss confocal. Um, and you'll see you know, that the software guesses a number of things correctly, a number of things incorrectly, and then a few just make stuff up. Um, so let's kind of work through it. So in this panel, we need to give the software information for each of these things that it requires here. And so the first thing it requires is what the spacings were. So the spacings are basically the pixel sizes in X, Y, those are those two numbers, and in Z, meaning the spacing between the slices in the Z stack. For the Zeiss confocals, AutoCont reads those correctly, so you don't need to worry about those. Those are fine. The next um, items here are the emission peaks of the fluorophores that you used. Okay, so the software has, um, the AutoQuant software doesn't really know what fluorophores you used. Um, and when you give it data from the Zeiss confocals, it tries to guess um, based on how the filters were set up. And sometimes it will even say what fluorophore it's guessing that you used, but the emission peaks are typically not set correctly. And you need these numbers to be the emission peaks of your fluorophores. So you need to know which channel was which fluorophore. So for example, in this case, the fluorophores that were used in this example were Psi 5, Alexa Fluor 546, Alexa Fluor 488, and DAPI. And so what we need to do is here find in this drop-down menu each of those fluorophores. Uh, luckily, you can just type it. Um, okay, so it's a little bit slow. Okay, so the typing is, doesn't seem like it's going to work uh, in the remote connection while I'm recording. But if we look through the list, here you can see Psi 5. So Psi 5, it's the name of the die. And in, in parentheses, that's actually the important thing. That's the, That number is the emission peak of that die. Okay, so that's that's one. The second one I said was Alexa Fluor 546. So let me find that one in this list. Sometimes they're called Alexa 546. Sometimes they're called Alexa Fluor 546. So you may have to look a little bit. One thing that's a little bit annoying about the software is when you click on Alexa 546, you can see it says Alexa 546. The important number is what's in parentheses. That's the emission peak of this die. Um, but you can see if I click somewhere else, the 546 disappears. And so that's a little bit confusing. Which Alexa was it? Well, you're just going to have to trust that it's the one that you chose. And if you have any doubts, you'll have to go back and check. Um, OK, so the, the, the green channel is Alexa Fluor 488. So let me go find Alexa Fluor 488. And then the blue channel in this particular experiment was DAPI. So let me go find DAPI. Um, and the DAPI emission peak, I don't know why there's one that says 44.7. Point five. Uh, the, the DAPI emission peak is 461 nanometers. The modality was a laser scanning confocal uh, for uh, images taken on a Zeiss confocal. That's correct. This was the objective lens that was used. And this is the critical thing, the numerical aperture. That's a characteristic of the lens that was used that is, um, was extracted correctly from the metadata from this image. OK, so there's two more things that we need. Uh, one is the immersion medium. So the immersion medium is if you were using an air, a water, or an oil objective, or a silicon oil objective. And so you need to put in what's called the refractive index of that immersion media. So the refractive index is how much slower light propagates in that media compared to a vacuum. And so for the particular oil that we use on uh, all of our systems in the lab, that number is not 1.515. Um, it is 1.5. 
0.18. So you will need to go in there and adjust that. Uh, let's see if I can do that here. Okay, maybe I can. Okay, um, for reasons I don't understand, um, I think it has something to do with the recording. I was unable to change the values while I was recording, so I stopped the recording. I input the correct values, um, and now I'm going to explain what I did. So as I was saying, the refractive index of the oil that we use on our all, all of our oil objectives, except uh, the silicon oil objective, on the spinning disk, so every other oil objective we have, um, the refractive index of the oil is 1.518. Um, so that's why I changed this. It said 1.515. I changed it to 1.518. Um, that's a number that's um, on the side of the bottle with the oil that we use on the LSM 700. Um, the other value we need is the refractive index of the sample. And so this uh, was set originally to water, where the refractive index is 1.333. Uh, but actually, this sample was mounted in Prolong Gold, and then the Prolong Gold was sealed immediately. And so when you do that, if you look online, you can find in the Prolong Gold manual, if you look here, there's a curve that shows you how the refractive index increases over time. And so this is a process that occurs because of the contact of the Prolong Gold with air. Um, it starts at 1.39, and then it grows. Um, the thing is, if you seal it immediately, which was what was done with these particular samples, it will stay stuck at 1.39. Um, and so that is why I put 1.39 here. Now, notice that it still says water. Uh, we could make this say whatever we wanted. It could say water. It could say prolonged gold. It could say Snoopy. It doesn't matter. Uh, the only thing that the software really reads is whatever's in parentheses. Okay. Uh, finally, the distance from the cover slip is zero microns because these were grown on the cover slip. Um, so there's no need to adjust that parameter. Okay, so now I have all these settings. I'm going to apply these settings to the image. And because setting these things up took a while, uh, I'm going to save these settings uh, because I would like to reuse them for other files. If you recall, we have four other files that we want to adjust. And so we're gonna um, save the settings so we don't have to do this all over again. So I'm gonna save them. Uh, I'm going to go to where those files are. Uh, so they're in D, staff data, Pablo, AQ demo, and okay. So once again, I seem to have had a problem every time I try and type something, um, it won't let me. So I just copied and pasted from somewhere else. Um, let me save this. Uh, what I'm doing is saving these settings. Okay, so there we have the settings saved. So what we're going to do now. We have our image, so we have our data, we have everything we need for the software to make a model um, of how this data was generated, what interaction of sample and microscope led to this data. Um, and so now we're going to do the deconvolution. And so to do it, we're going to click here. And if you look, you'll see there's one, two, three, four. Um, sort of steps that we need to take care of. The first refers to what deconvolution method we're going to use. The second refers to what point spread function settings we're going to use. The third is the settings of the deconvolution procedure itself, and the fourth are the output settings. For the overwhelming majority of things that people in the core do, for one, two, and three, the defaults are fine. So you really don't need to mess with these. You do need to go into the output settings and make sure that this is um, set up correctly. And so the way you do that is you click here on this icon, and then you decide where you're going to put your deconvolved images, what they'll be called, what kind of file you're going to use, and what the data type is going to be. So I recommend, at least when you start, just put it you know, wherever your, your original data was, that's fine. In terms of how to save them, I would save them as um, a bitplane IMS5 file, which is a .ims um, format. The reason I recommend this is because this format can be read by Amaris, uh, which is um, a 3D visualization and analysis software that we have, and also Amaris Viewer, which is a, three, a free image, um, 3D three-dimensional visualizer. 
which is very good. So um, that's convenient. It's also convenient because it can be opened in Fiji, which is open source and free. Um, so you can look at things there. And it also automatically generates one image as opposed to multiple channels that you then need to merge, um, which sort of adds complications. So I would, I would save it as an IMS uh, 5 file. As far as data type, if your data came from a confocal uh, in the microscopy services lab, and you did not mess with the bit depth of the images, you can save them as a 16-bit unsigned integer and you will be fine. If the images came from anywhere else where the, where the image bit depth might have been 16-bit, you need to save it as a 32-bit floating point. In the microscopy services lab, that applies to data from the IX81 or um, the spinning disk, Hagrid, okay? Uh, but if you're coming from one of the confocals and you didn't mess with the bit depth of the image, 16-bit unsigned integer is fine. If you prefer, you can use 32-bit floating point. Um, that's not going to screw up anything in your images. It'll just be bigger. Uh, but if you're sure you didn't mess with the bit depth, then this will be fine for confocal images. So I now say save. I'm not saving the image. I'm saving how I'm going to save the image. It's a little bit meta, but that's what we're doing when we click save here. Okay. So once all of that is done, uh, we're going to kick this check mark and that's going to launch the deconvolution. And so it's quite fast. Once it launches the deconvolution, then it generates uh, a new preview image. So let me rearrange this here. Apologies, my monitor is a bit small. I'm remoting in from my laptop. Okay. All right. So. What you might be able to see, let's see if we can, is that the quality of the deconvolved image is substantially better. So a place where you can see this is in the red. So you can see if you look here, there's less graininess than if you look there. And the same is true for the green channel. So if you look at this part of the image and you compare with this part of the image, you can see or here, that this is a significantly less grainy image. Now, the reason they don't look that different is because actually the original image was already quite high contrast. Um, so the better your starting point, the less the improvement. Whereas if you start with something that was quite noisy, you'll see a much more drastic improvement. Okay, so this is um, the deconvolved image. Um, if you acquired Z-Stacks properly on our confocals, I strongly recommend you always do this because it will improve the quality of your images, uh, sometimes a little, sometimes dramatically, and uh, the investment of time and money to do that is actually very low compared to what you would need to do on the confocal to get an image that looked like this. So it's, it's always recommended to do this. Um, so where is the image and what does it look like and how do I open the file? So um, Apologies for all these things. This is while I was trying to sort out the problem where it wouldn't let me type things. Okay, so um, this is the original folder where we had everything. So we started with five files, these .lsm files. We, we knew we had saved the decon settings file, and then there's a bunch of other stuff. So the other stuff is the following. When you open a file in AutoQuant, it automatically creates uh, of an XML version of that file, which contains all this metadata. When you deconvolve it, it automatically generates a new file, which is this image1.ims, and an XML associated with that one. So essentially the number of files multiplies by about four. So you have to be very organized and keep track of everything. Now, as I said, this is an Imaris file. So if we double click on it, it will be opened by Imaris. And then you can do whatever three-dimensional visualization or analysis you want to do there. It can also be opened in Fiji, which I'll do in a moment. Let's let Mars open. And so here you can see, you know, 
fairly quick three-dimensional visualization of this. Um, so that's one option. The other option is to open that file in Fiji. So let me open Fiji. So if I drag this file into Fiji, um, I get this. This is sort of Fiji's Swiss Army knife to open up any kind of imaging file. If I just say OK, um, you can see here, yeah, channel one. This is obviously a control because channel one doesn't have anything. Um, this is the red channel. This is the green channel. And then here's um, the DAPI. Okay, so um, if we go back to AutoQuant, um, one, one thing to keep in mind uh, is when you open it in Fiji, sometimes it'll give you the option, if the image is a little bit bigger, of opening it in different resolution levels. You wanna choose the resolution level that has the highest number of pixels, and it's usually the one at the top. Um, so if you're in a situation like that, just choose that one. Okay, so that's how you use AutoQuant to deconvolve one file. But you typically don't want to deconvolve just one. You want to deconvolve more than one, and you want to do it in an efficient, um, batched way. So now I'm going to show you how to do that. So I'm going to close AutoQuant. It's always better to just close it and start over if you're going to do something very different, which I am. So I'm going to open AutoQuant again. But now instead of dragging one file into AutoQuant, I'm going to drag multiple files into AutoQuant. So. I'm going to grab the remaining files, the ones I didn't deconvolve, and I'll drag all of those in. When I do that, um, AutoQuant no longer shows a preview. And the reason is when you drag in more than one file, it assumes you want to do some sort of batch work. And so it doesn't want to generate a preview because you might have dragged in 100 files. And so if it did that, it would start eating up a lot of the memory and system resources. So it just assumes that you're going to do be working in batch mode and that you don't want to see previews. If you did want to see a preview, you could get it by double clicking on one of these and there it would show it to you. Okay, but I don't actually want to do that. I don't need to do that right now. Um, what I'm going to do is do a batch deconvolution of all of them. And so the way you do a batch deconvolution is you set up your settings for one of them and then you propagate those settings to all the rest. So in this case, I'm gonna just set it up for which, whichever one is at the top of my list. It happens to be image two. So I know that I need to apply the settings that I saved. So I'm gonna go here. I'm gonna get those settings that we made before. Um, one quirk of the software is if you had written here, prolong gold, uh, that typically will disappear and revert back to water, but the numbers, which is what the software actually is using, those will be correct. So it's a, uh, let's just call it a quirk and leave it at that. Okay, so um, I loaded the settings. Now I'm going to apply the settings. So I've applied the settings to image two. Now I'm gonna go up here and go to the 3D deconvolution section. I'm going to go again to output settings and I want to save it as an Amaris file. So bitplane IMS5 file. And data type will be 16-bit unsigned integer. That's fine. I'm going to say save. So again, what I'm saving is not the image yet. I'm just saving where I'm going to save it. And so now instead of clicking on launch, I'm going to click here on add to batch. So what this does is this puts it in a staging area of sort of things that we want to do. So what I need to do now, this one's ready to go. You can say it says valid. Yes. So this one is ready. What we want to do is add all the rest. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select them all, just shift clicking. Then I'm going to right click and say send to batch. So when I do that, they all end up here in the staging area, but these don't have valid settings. Okay. So the way I'm going to solve that is I'm going to click on the first one. I'm going to right click. Okay, here we go. I'm going to say copy all settings. And then I'm going to select all of them and apply the settings to all of them. And so to select all of them, I actually have to do it here. So if you shift click on the name, it doesn't work. You have to shift click on the column, another quirk. Um, and then I'm going to right click and this I have to do on the name and say paste all settings and launch. So what I'm going to do is basically put all the settings that were in image two on all of the other ones and just launch them. And so there it, they went to the pending area. 
and then the GPU grabbed them and it's working on them. And if you want to see the progress, you can click here. And so it's just blazing through them and it's done. So now if we look here, we have all the deconvolve files. Note that the deconvolve files have a 10 underscore. Uh, that's just how um, AutoQuant automatically names things that it deconvolves. Okay, so I hope that was useful. Um, and if you have questions, just send me an email.